Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another of the most significant programs on the air today, Words at War, dramatizing the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Tonight, an eyewitness account of the Polish underground, Jan Karski's Story of a Secret State. My name is Jan Karski, Polish officer and member of the underground. Before the war, I was interested in demography, the science and statistics of populations, and was completing my doctor's thesis in that subject. I lived with my brothers and sister in Warsaw, and like many others in Poland at that time, I was blithely unaware of what the future had in store for us as a nation and as a people. I remember particularly the night of August 31st, 1939. This is a delightful party, Mr. Demendez. Simply delightful. Thank you, thank you. Come, Mr. Karski. You must tell me more of the beauties of Warsaw. You were describing the botanical gardens, weren't you? The best in Europe. I will take you there tomorrow, mademoiselle. Oh, I wouldn't miss them for anything in the world. I just love your city. It's perfectly charming, and I hope to see... It was a gay party. We drank wine and danced interminably. During the course of the evening, I made a number of appointments for the following week. The affair ended late. I came home tired and full of intoxicating plans for the future. And then the next morning, the news no one expected came. Poland invaded! Poland invaded by German army! I joined my regiment. We were shipped to the front. We made hasty, haphazard preparations to check the German blitzkrieg. And we talked big. We'll smash the enemy before he gains another inch of Polish ground. That's right. We won't compromise like other nations. We'll fight. Germany is weak and Hitler is bluffing. Forward to victory! A week later, we no longer had an army. And Poland ceased to exist as an independent state. And I, Jan Karski, was a prisoner of war in deep Russia. In November 1939, I was making my way to Warsaw, through streets and highways clogged with refugees. I'd been exchanged by the Russian authorities to the Germans as a war prisoner. Later, I escaped from a Nazi internment camp at Rodon, hoping to find some resistance alive. Warsaw was a shocking ruin of its former self. I passed through street after street, heaped with rubble and debris. I was hungry, exhausted, without funds, not sure whether my family or friends were still alive. The Nazi soldiers nearly guard were everywhere, parading up and down the streets. Nazi guards and Gestapo men were posted on every corner, scrutinizing everyone who passed by. Keep moving, you poor friend. Don't congregate. Finally, I came to the house of my friend Paul. I made sure no one was following me and knocked on the door. Jan. Hello, Paul. I'm glad to see you. I, I need help. Not here. Come inside. Now, what have you been doing, Jan? Where did you come from? Radom. I escaped three days ago. What about you, Paul? Oh, I've gotten by. You look as if you've been through a great deal. Sit down, Jan. Never mind that, Paul. We must do something. What do you mean? I mean we can't just stand by and let them take over. Warsaw is no longer the same city. We no longer have a country. What's to become of us? Conditions are not as bad as some people think. The last battle has not yet been fought, Jan. But, Paul... Take it easy. What about yourself? A man like you, young and healthy, you're in constant danger. You can be picked up at any moment and sent to a forced labor camp. Have you any plans? None whatsoever. Do you have any papers? Any money? No. Would you have the nerve to live under a false passport? I... Why, yes, but... What makes you think it's so easy to obtain false papers? They can be obtained. But can I obtain them? Shall I have to pay much? And where will I get the money? You ask too many questions, John. I'm sorry, Paul. Times like these, it's not healthy to be so inquisitive. What'll I do, then? Well, you'll need a place to live, first of all. Now, this is the address of the apartment I'm sending you to. Here you are. Go there, get some supplies. Don't leave the apartment and don't speak to anybody. I'll come in a few days and tell you what's to be done. And bye now. Don't worry. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate this. There's one more thing, Jan. Yes? Just remember this. Poland has been defeated, but she's not been conquered.
This was my initiation into the Polish underground. Two days later, Paul came with my forged papers, and I became a member of a strange new world in which I was destined to live during the following years. Staged daily on the streets of Warsaw to recruit slave labor for Germany's industrial machine. There are also other types of manhunts carried out just as systematically, but for different purposes. They are here, Herr Leutnant. Seventeen on this rate. Fine. Let's take a look at them. All right, girls. Line up. Line up. Single file. Hey, front. You notice, they are all blonde, Herr Leutnant. Ages 16 to 20. And healthy, as you instructed. Yes. A very nice catch this time, Kunze. Mm -hmm. They'll do very nicely. This one, uh, the pretty one on the left. Bring her to me later. <laughs> yes. Yes, Herr Leutnant, of course. All right, girls. I think you know what's expected of you. You shall now get a bath, manicure, hair set, and no other trimming. Then you will be assigned to the officer's quarter. You should consider yourself fortunate. From now on, you'll get plenty of food and your life will be easy. Besides, you'll be contributing directly to the welfare and happiness of the officers of the Third Reich. To the manhunt were soon added other methods of depopulation and rule by terror. Are you Lizovsky? Yes. Your house is being taken over by the Third Reich. Be ready to evacuate in two hours. You are permitted to take ten pounds of food and linen. And your home must be cleaned and put in good order for your German successors. No Pole is permitted to take employment without an employment certificate. All Poles who cannot produce satisfactory evidence of employment will be sent to a concentration camp. The grave is finished, Herr Leutnant. Very good. Line them up. Line up, you Polish swine! Line up! Now face the grave! All right, Schmidt. Proceed. Yes, Herr Leutnant. Fire! Ah! To 
counter these measures, the Polish underground prepared to take actions of reprisal. And after I had familiarized myself with the underground methods, routine and discipline, I received the order for my first mission. Skarsky, tomorrow morning you will go to Lwów. The mission will be to establish a union between the organization of that city and Warsaw. In the center of the city will find a clothing store called Vitex. Contact the proprietor. Two days later, I arrived in Lwów and went directly to the designated clothing store in the center of the business district. Good evening. Good evening. What can I do for you? Are you Mr. Vitek? Yes. Greetings from Antoine. I have a personal message for you. Come into the back room. Well? I am from Warsaw, Mr. Vitek. I have information to give you from Mr. Boretsky. I never heard of him. I don't know anybody in Warsaw except one or two relatives. Look, my name is Karski. I was sent here as a courier to improve the relations between the Lvov and Warsaw underground organizations and to inform you of the new plans. I never heard of you, and I have no connection with anybody in Warsaw. Is there anything else I can do for you? But I came from Warsaw to deliver a message. You've got to listen. Mr. Karski, or whatever your name is, if you don't leave my store at once, I shall be forced to call the occupation authority. Very well. I'm sorry to have troubled you, Mr. Vitek. I... But I must have made a mistake. I mean, there was obviously some error. Goodbye, Mr. Vitek. I left the store hurriedly and walked toward the park. I knew I was being followed, but I didn't dare leave town. I had to find some method of contacting the underground and the vault. I sat on the park bench trying to figure out my next move when... Good evening, Mr. Karski. Vitek. I'm sorry for what happened in my store, but I had to make sure you were the right person. We must be careful. There are spies all over. Now, your message for Mr. Boretsky. I outlined the plan to him, and he listened attentively, nodding his head and interrupting to ask questions. Then he said, I would like you to inform Mr. Boretsky and the others in Warsaw that I am in complete accord with their principles. I will do my utmost to help carry out their plan. My mission accomplished, I returned to Warsaw. Then there followed other trips. Garski, we want you to go to Poznan and Lublin to contact the underground and then to Paris to report to the Polish government in exile. When I returned to Warsaw from Paris, the consolidation of the underground was proceeding rapidly and the network of conspiracy reached every corner of the city and suburbs. One of the divisions of the underground was the secret press. Risking their lives constantly, young and old, men and women, listened to foreign broadcasts and soundproof cellars and small huts set up in forests and attics with fake double roofs. All right, Miss Lane, take this story to the city desk and watch out for the Gestapo. The city desk was usually located in a basement or hut in the woods. Is the story all set up, Lizlovovsky? Ready to run it now. Here's the proof. Hmm. Today, the British Foreign Office announced that new evidence has been uncovered supporting the charge that slave labor is being used in Poland and in Germany to man the production line. At the same time, there has been a new outbreak of sabotage in Poland. All right, Ms. Lovsky, run off 2,000 copies. Distribution was another problem. Every kind of ruse was practiced. Krakauer Zeitung. Krakauer Zeitung, latest edition, buy your paper here. No Pole ever bought these German papers unless the boy smilingly said to him, Today you have extraordinary news about German victories. Buy it. That meant the copy was stuffed with an underground newspaper. Or a butcher would say to a woman customer while wrapping her meat, Put it on ice immediately when you reach home, will you? And the woman knew what he meant. There were other methods for keeping mass hate alive. There was a method called the renaming of the street. At 12 midnight, take down the name of Deborah Street from all the walls, street corners, lampposts, and placards, and substitute the name Roosevelt Street. And so, if you were with strangers, you could immediately tell which side they were on. If they said, I'm going to Roosevelt Street, you knew they were your own kind, members of the underground or patriots. But if they said, Come up and see me tonight, I'm on the Deborah Street, you knew you had to be careful and watch your tongue. 
We also develop specialists in sabotage and revenge, seasoned by experience. By the order of the underground government, this list of criminals will be released from the penitentiaries. This shall be done by means of fake documents, forged pardons, etc. Once released, these criminals will be encouraged to resume their former profession of thievery and murder, with this proviso that they confine their activities to the Germans. After the war, their sentences will be reduced in proportion to the success of their operations against the Germans. These were but a few functions of the underground. There were others, not quite so pleasant. The underground court, having examined the evidence against Josef Kolczyk, a citizen of Poland of German origin, finds him guilty of collaboration with the German authorities. For this crime against the people of Poland, the court orders that Josef Kolczyk be executed and sentenced to be administered by any convenient means within the next 24 hours. To carry out the work of the underground, it was, of course, necessary to have money. But even that problem was solved in time by the blackmail system. This is how the system worked. We will have to have some newsprint again. Well, how about contacting Herr Gerhardt? He's a high Nazi official, and there's nothing he won't do for a price. Fine. Go see him as soon as possible. Well, what's the maximum price you want me to pay? On this first transaction, pay him any price he asks. Because the transaction was highly illegal, and because the Nazis tried to make as much money out of Poland as they could, the price was usually outrageous. You know, I take great chances in selling this newsprint to you. It's really a crime against the Fatherland. So, naturally, I shall expect something extra for my services. The price shall be 100,000 marks. Oh, that's all right, Herr Gerhardt. That's a fair price. We'll arrange to have the money delivered to you by morning. Then the next time we needed newsprint, or anything else for that matter, this took place. Uh, here's a list of items we should like to buy, Herr Gerhardt. 100 rifles, 20 pistols, and 20 bales of newsprint. And we shall expect them at half their former price. Half price? Are you out of your mind? Listen, you Polish swine, I have a good mind to turn you over to, to the... To the Gestapo? I don't think so, Herr Gerhardt. You see, we have proof of all our former transactions. Photographed and documented. We shall be only too glad to let the Gestapo look into it. I see Dirty Polish swine. Very well. I shall see that you get delivery by morning. At half price? Yes, at half price. After several months in Warsaw, I was given another special assignment. Karski, we want you to go to Paris and deliver some secret documents to the Polish government in exile. They're all here on microfilm. If anything happens to you, destroy them at any cost. Two days later, I started on the trip. But this time, as I crossed the Slovakian border... Gestapo! There he is! Tell him! So, we've caught up with you at last, Herr Karski. All right, you're under arrest. Fortunately, there was a barrel of water nearby. I flung the microfilm into it. One hour later, I was being questioned by the Gestapo. Sit down, you dirty Polish swine. Are these your papers, Karski? You don't like talking to us. We aren't good enough for you. Answer the inspector, you swine. Yes, they are my papers. Thank you. So good of you to acknowledge my question. As long as you are in that frame of mind, my friend, you won't mind telling me the entire truth about your connection with the underground? I have no connection with the underground. You can see by my papers, I am the son of a Lvov teacher. And for how long have you been the son of a Lvov teacher? Two months? Three months? No, sir. All my life. I am a student. I wanted to go to Switzerland to study. And not by any chance did you want to go to France to join the Polish army? No, sir. No? Very no. Won't you excuse me if I don't listen to you anymore? What was on the film you threw in the water? They were films of the ruins of Warsaw. Then why <laughs> did you throw them in the water? Answer but... me. I don't know. You're lying, you Polish spy. Let's work on him and leave just enough of him to be questioned. The next day I was questioned again, beaten again. There's another session the third day. 
I knew that I had arrived at the end, that I should never survive another beating. I had a razor blade that I had hidden in my mattress. I took it out and cut into my wrists. The blood began to spurt out, and then I lost consciousness. Where am I? Don't be frightened. You're in a Slovakian hospital. We're going to make you well. In a moment, you'll receive a blood transfusion. I remember praying that I would not come back to life. A sharp instrument jabbed into my leg. I tried to pull away. This will do you good. I tried to stop them. Tear away from their hands. Then black. Next morning, I was awakened by a feminine voice. A nun was standing at my bedside. Listen carefully. Act as sick as you can. And don't be afraid. The entire staff, doctors, nurses and attendants, is all Polish. Word has been sent to your superiors. Be patient. Take good care of yourself. I will return in a few days. Two days later, she came back. You are going to be set free tonight. I have just put cyanide under your pillow. It kills quickly. But don't use it unless you're absolutely certain the worst has come. About eight o'clock that evening, the doctor examined me again. Listen carefully. Everything has been arranged. At midnight, I will pass this room and light a cigarette. That is your cue. Take off your clothes. I'll have some others for you. And go to the first floor. On one of the window sills, you will find a rose. Jump from that sill. Men will be standing below. Is everything clear? Yes. Good. Good luck. It was exactly 12 midnight when the doctor appeared in the doorway. He drew a cigarette from his pocket, lit it, and moved on. I slid out of bed, took off my hospital pajamas, and stuffed them under the cover. Completely naked, I padded down to the first floor. There in front of me was the open window. The rose had been blown from the sill to the floor. Was it an omen? It didn't matter. I had to take a chance. I stared for a moment at the blackness below and jumped. All right, Karski, put this coat on over you. Everything's been arranged to keep you out of sight until the chase cools off. Welcome back to the underground, friend. It was a year after my escape from the Gestapo before I was able to help again. The underground had arranged a place of convalescence for me. At last, fully recovered, I was summoned to a secret meeting place. Follow me. This way, to your right. In here. As I entered, I saw grouped around the table the men who controlled the destiny of Poland, the leaders of the major political parties, the chief delegate of the Polish government in London, the commander-in-chief of the underground army, the leader of the socialist party stood up. Mr. Karski, we're happy to see you so well recovered. Thank you, gentlemen. The purpose of this meeting is to provide you with material which you will take to London to our government in exile. Before leaving Poland, however, you will contact the leaders of the Jewish underground and make a tour of the Warsaw Ghetto so that you'll be able to make a first-hand account of conditions there. I made the trip the following day, and I shall never forget it. The entire population of the ghetto seemed to be living in the street. There was hardly a square yard of empty space. Everywhere there was hunger, misery... The atrocious stench of decomposing bodies, the moans of dying children, the desperate cries and gasps of a people struggling for life against impossible odds. Frequently, we passed by corpses lying naked in the streets. My guide explained... When a Jew dies, his family removes his clothing and throws his body into the street. If not, they have to pay the Germans to have the body buried. They have instituted a burial tax which no one here can afford. Besides, this saves clothing. And here every rag counts. But I don't see many old people. Do they stay inside all day? No. Don't you understand the German system yet? Those whose muscles are still capable of any effort to use for forced labor. The others are murdered by quota. First come the sick and aged. Then the unemployed. Finally those who work on roads and trains and factories. Wait. What's the matter, Karsky? You must see this. This is something for you to tell the world about. What? Where? Inside the building. Quick, please, hurry. Finally, my guide seemed beside himself, and my curiosity drove me on, too. 
At last, we reached the top floor. My guide knocked on the door. What do you want? Do your windows face the street? No, the courtyard. What do you want? Never mind. Follow me, Karski. Quick, cross the hall. Quickly. There. Come to the window. There. Look through the slit on the side. Now you'll see something. You would never believe it if you didn't see it for yourself. I look through the opening. In the middle of the street, two young Nazi soldiers were approaching the building. Suddenly, one of them pulled a gun out of his hip pocket. Now watch him. Watch him closely. He's looking for a target. He raised his arm and took careful aim. The boy who fired the shot shouted with joy. Then they linked arms and walked off. That is what is known as the hunt. It happens every day. Keeps them in practice and provides convenient targets. I stood there, afraid to change the position of my body. I was seized with such a feeling of nausea that I could not make the effort of will to take a single step. Well, have you seen enough? Take me out of here. Take me out of here. I clattered down the stairs. In the street, I broke into a run. I had to get out of there. I had to get a breath of fresh air, a drink of clean water. Everything here was polluted with death, filth, and decay. I kept running until we reached the street door that led to the outside world. Finally, I left Poland to make my report to the world. At last, I was free to fight in the open, free to recite to all men the Lord's Prayer of the Polish Underground. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread is a toil beyond any endurance. And forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us, O Lord, should we be too weak to crush the beast. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but let the traitors and spies among us perish. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one, from the foe of our Polish land. Amen. Let us again be the hosts of our own soil. Amen. Give us freedom, O Lord. Amen. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you a dramatization of Jan Karski's book, Story of a Secret State. The radio dramatization was written by Ben Kagan, and Morton DaCosta played Jan Karski. The music was arranged and played by William Meader, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. <laughs> Because of a special broadcast, Words at War will not be heard next week. However, two weeks from tonight, at our usual time, we'll bring you the latest published book on the fighting in the Pacific, entitled Battle Report. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National.